We are going to get started. Uh, my name is Mark Belker. I'm the executive director of Seattle Management Greenway. How are you all doing tonight? Good. 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 All right. Well, it's going to get even better once I turn things over to our host, Edwin Lindo. But first, tonight's organizers asked me to say a few words about what this panel series is and why mobility justice is a part of it. You know, for more than a decade, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways has been organizing and mobilizing people to make every neighborhood a great place to walk, bike, and live. And our work is really guided by the values of safety, equity, sustainability, and the idea and belief that we should be able to move freely and safely as a fundamental right throughout our city. In July 2020, we convened Who Streets Our Streets, a black, indigenous, and people of color focused work, work group to examine the role of enforcement in transportation with a pro-equity and anti-racist framework. And more generally, in Seattle Labor Greenway's organizing for Safe Streets Citywide, we really focus our investments as an organization in those communities most impacted by traffic violence, which are unfortunately disproportionately communities of color. So if you're an organizer with Who Streets Our Streets, or you're on Taylor and Bird Greenway's board or staff, or you're a volunteer with one of the local campaigns, just throw your hands up in the air so we can recognize you. Thank you. <laughs> this change is hard, and that's why it's so encouraging to see so many of you here tonight. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this. Um, this event series would not be possible without our sponsors. Uh, Washington Bike Law, Expedia Group, the Seattle Department of Transportation, the Bolin Fund, Lime, Fleming Law, Site Workshop, MIG, GGN, Beneficial State Bank, Commute Seattle, WSB, and Alta Planning and Design. Thank you all so much for your support. And it's, it's fitting that our host tonight is Edwin Lindo. Um, Edwin is the co-founder and curator of Esselisa's Library, the co-founder of North Star Cycling. North Star? Yeah, great group. Woo. The assistant Woo. dean of social and health justice at the University of Washington School of Medicine, and the co-director of Harborview Injury Prevention Research Center. Edwin, I'm honored to be here, here with you tonight. Thank you so much for kicking us out here. Woo. Energy up just a little bit. How y'all feeling? We, we have some folks that came in on their bikes. We have folks that came in light rail. We have folks like me that got stuck in traffic at UW and I left my car and hopped in the light rail. Because it's crazy out there. But I, I just want to say it was an honor to be asked, Merlin and the rest of the folks from Seattle neighborhood. Uh, Greenway said, Edwin, would you be willing to host? And, uh, I think I'm a good host, uh, but I, I think I'm just better at being in community with y'all and sharing this faith with y'all, so I'm just super grateful that we get to talk about the amazing work that's been happening, the amazing work that's not only happening in this local area, but across Seattle. And what that means is folks dedicating themselves, even when it isn't in the limelight, to push, to challenge, to advocate, to mobilize, to organize, and say we have some things that our communities deserve and we haven't gotten them yet. And that's what you're, you'll hear today. We have three parts. We have Lorena, who is going to be uh, talking to us from the work happening with ACLU. We have Rosa that will be talking to us with uh, work happening in South Park. Uh, we also have Ethan with Who Streets, Our Streets, who will be giving us a presentation as well. So we are in for a treat. We still got food in the back. Uh, I want to highlight that we have Cascade, we have Lime, and we have folks here that are wanting to support this work, that have been committed to this work. So take your time, and at the end, uh, oh, we also have some youth present. I apologize, so excuse me, we have future leaders presenting. And then we'll have a mixer. Uh, so hopefully you don't eat all the food before the mixer happens. Uh, and we'll get to hang out and talk with each other. Uh, so if we can get started. Um, oh, excuse me, one last item, logistically. Because we have future leaders in the house, one request was that they not be photographed uh, when they're presenting or in the photographs that you're taking of the audience. You can take photographs, but please do your best to keep them out of it uh, because we just don't want to, to be posting them on social media, especially without their permission. So can we all accept that? Yes. Yeah, yes. cool. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Give me one second. 
there, there. Great. So well, we're going to have our, each of the speakers come up, and I have the, the honor of introducing each of them. Quick story, the, the first speaker is uh, a friend and also someone who helped me get through STP this past weekend. Uh, there's a few of us in here from North Star, from ABC Cycling, Cascade, and Bike Works that uh, decided to, to take the ride. If you've ever thought about it, we recommend it. I decided two weeks before, and I was terrified. <laughs> and if I can do it, you can most definitely do it. There's a lot of support. Our communities are, are supporting each other. And it, was a, it was a good time. Also, the story with Ethan is uh, with Who Street, Our Streets, we had a number of conversations around the helmet law, as you all remember. And, and you may talk a little bit about this, but I'm going to share a quick story. Is you heard in my intro that I'm a co-director in the Harborview Injury Prevention Research Center. They also study, and there's folks there that study at Harborview, uh, TBI, which is traumatic brain injury. They were also the group that adamantly opposed removing the helmet law. And so you say, well, Edwin, what the heck are you doing there? Because North Star, myself, and Ethan were advocating and saying, what is going on here? And, and the reason is because I told them straight to their face, because I work at UW. And I said, there is no reason we should be criminalizing our community safety. That doesn't make any sense. And if the goal is actually to keep them safe, then why don't we just give them helmets? And those conversations led, yeah, give it up to all the work. I mean, that was a big trip. It was a beautiful thing to see. It was a thing. But the director of the center said, Edwin, I'm so appreciative that we're having this conversation. Because you're right. Our research isn't in how the, the research should be applied. It's in making sure that people are safe. And, and we do believe at North Star, we don't want to crack this thing. We want to keep it as safe as possible. It does minimize hospitalization. It does minim minimize mortality. But don't give me a ticket and don't put me in jail for it. But that's what happened. That was happening in this part of the community, in the South End, in South Park. And we said, no, we're definitely not having that. So when Ethan and I got together, uh, it was really fun to push the institution that I work at and, and I'll, I'll be very blunt. They came to me and said, Edwin, you're going to have to be careful. Because there's some powerful people who are not happy with the position you take. And I share that because sometimes we do have to take those positions. Right? Sometimes we've got to say the thing that no one is willing to say, even when we're working in that institution, that organization, or that place. Uh, so Ethan, if I can welcome you up, super grateful for the work that you've done for the work you continue to do and for the information and education you can share with us. Thank you, Edward. And it is an honor to be here in the community with Evelyn, North Star, ABC, and so many other groups. Um, I'm so grateful that you all came out to listen learn today, and I think what, what you said about saying the thing that, that no one else wants to say but needs to be said, that really hits home, and it's uh, on point for what I'll be sharing today on automated enforcement. So, I'm hoping this isn't audible, Nancy. <laughs> um, I'm here representing Who Streets Our Streets. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about who WSOS is. And I'm going to be talking about automated uh, traffic camera enforcement specifically through Justice Lens. Before this, I want to just preface it by making clear that you know, we, we have these automated cameras to give out tickets to keep people safe. That's the, the core purpose. They work at deterring speeding. They're effective at that. We don't contest that. Just like with the helmet law review, we weren't contesting that helmets do save lives. They do. But we need a policy change on this. And I'll talk about why that's the case. So who is Who's Streets Our Streets? We are a BIPOC-led work group convened uh, in 2020 during the protest by Seattle neighborhood Greenways. And we use a pro-equity, anti-racist framework to review laws and policies covering the use of streets in Seattle to correct wrongs, not to make wrongs right. And we uh, are working uh, in community, surveying community, learning what community wants, what they need, 
and then fighting for the, the policies that will get us there. You can learn more about our work. Uh, our website is rstreets.org. I'll say a bit about what we're doing on automated course that near the end of this, but I want to just introduce this issue by reminding us that traffic violence affects us all, right? If I were to ask for a show of hands on how many of you know someone who's been hurt or maybe even killed in a traffic crash, it really does. But it doesn't affect all of us equally. And we know uh, there's a, a great New York Times article from earlier this year talking about the racial gap in traffic violence across the US. This is not a Seattle issue only. This is a uh, uniquely American issue. And roadway deaths are rising. They are disproportionately affecting folks walking and not bikes, and disproportionately affecting those who are black and Hispanic. Why is this the case? I think we have a pretty good handle on why it's the case. As the New York Times wrote, the design of our cities is partly to blame, I would say mostly to blame, for these troubling disparities. Black and Hispanic neighborhoods share a history of underinvestment, basic traffic safety measures, things like crosswalks, things like bike lanes, right? Real basic. And an overinvestment in automobile infrastructure meant to speed through people who do not live there. Sound familiar to anyone? Yeah. And we see those, those disparities here in this, in this chart. It is a Seattle issue, very much. And if you compare these maps of our high injury roadway network, we actually call it a network. Uh, here in Seattle, and with the percentage of uh, people of color, that's the map on the right, they're the same map. Right? Lake City, Soto, South End, it, it all lights up. And this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's, you know, bike down right here in God forbid. <laughs> or anyone who's, who's uh, you know, travels regularly in the South End. Our roads are dangerous. But we know how to fix this. I want to just uh, ask if anyone can shout out, this is, this is uh, Rainier Ave right here. Four lanes, kind of looks like a, a highway. How fast would you drive? For those who drive here, how, how fast does this road want you to drive? 45. 30, 40, 45? I wouldn't say 45, maybe 40. But fast, right? And this is, this is about the design, right? We can design for the behavior that we want. We know this, we've known this for years. Not how fast would you drive? Shut up. Slower. Slower. <laughs> yeah, I mean at least five, right? At least at least five, maybe ten miles an hour slower. This works, and SDOT has shown it in their data. This is uh, Rainier through Columbia City and Homeland City. They haven't redesigned the whole corridor, obviously. But injury collisions down thirty percent. Collisions with people walking and biking down forty percent. Hop end speeding down seventy five percent. These changes work. We know how to make safer streets is through concrete. And enforcement is rarely the only or the best way to do this. That said, in Seattle, we've decided to take a different path. And our city's solution, uh, increasingly, is camera ticketing. Right? As a consequence of the fact that our most dangerous roadways run through communities of color in Seattle, and the fact that we've placed cameras on those dangerous roadways, which you know seems like a justifiable decision until you think about where those roadways are, our school zone speed cameras and red light cameras have disproportionately been placed in lower income communities with more people of color. And that disparity is stark. This is from an SDOT analysis that they did last year. Meanwhile, uh, if many of you know what's been going on in the South End in terms of safety projects, delay after delay after delay. So this is what we've chosen as a city. And it's not just where these cameras are, right? It's the policies that matter. And it just so happens that we as a city have kind of chosen some of the worst options. If you look at even Chicago, which is known for really uh, predatory, punitive camera enforcement, they do better than us in some of these ways. Um, our tickets are exorbitantly expensive, $237 per speed ticket. Is that just? Is that necessary? <coughs> If you can't afford to pay, good luck. Uh, alternatives to payment are limited. Uh, you can do community service, but 
that's a minimal wage. It's going to take 14 hours to work off that ticket. How many people have that time? 32% of tickets go unpaid as a consequence. Get sent to collections, ruining your credit score. Uh, we get no mercy here. Uh, first time warnings are common elsewhere, but not in Seattle. Um, despite Seattle having shown that when we do give out warnings, they're 95% effective at preventing the second effects. And our cameras don't trigger at 10 miles an hour like many jurisdictions, they trigger at five. Fines don't change depending on how fast you're going. And I think really critically, we are using camera enforcement in our city as a first resort. We have no robust policy, SDOT has no policy, to make sure that they try at least a speed bump before putting in a camera. Sometimes they do, but often they don't. And there's no transparency about uh, data privacy issues, right? These are a surveillance technology, and we have this robust uh, surveillance ordinance in the city, and yet we've classified automated enforcement as not a surveillance technology, <laughs> meaning that there's no transparency about how this data gets used to us access to it. A common refrain that I think we hear is that automated enforcement is great because it's not police. It's not a traffic stop, and, and that's true. It's not. But th as that argument goes, it's replacing police, right? It's not augmenting police, it's, it's supposed to replace it. But we have no mechanism in place in, in Seattle, there's really no mechanism uh, anywhere else in the model for this to ensure that that replacement actually happens. And then we're also dependent on this revenue, right? The red light camera revenue, three billion dollars, goes to the city's general fund, creating dependency on that. We, we fund our safe routes to school, uh, physical infrastructure safety improvements, through our speed camera fund. And when that fund dropped, those improvements were, uh, were, were in jeopardy, right? So there are a lot of issues. We can do better. We know how to do better. Uh, the city ought to do better. What are we doing about this as history centuries, right? We're trying to elevate this into our city's conversation because these cameras have been around for almost two decades now and we just really haven't been talking about it. We're kind of sleepwalking into this expansion that the city has proposed. We hold a town hall, we've been doing surveys, both uh, online and in person, uh, at events. Here's a, a photo of, of uh, Kale over there, Kale, uh, June team. And uh, we have you know, put out an op-ed, uh, I encourage you to check it out. We uh, have some blog posts, we have some preliminary recommendations that we're revisiting because we have 300 surveys we're waiting through. So we're doing a lot of outreach and trying to figure out where the community is on this. This is work the city should be doing. We're doing that work. And I just want to uplift some voices from community members, things that we've heard in our surveys in person and our listening sessions. I was between jobs and had to pay for my medication. When I got a school zone speaking ticket, I had to choose between paying the ticket and paying, reducing my, med my medication, right? A $230 ticket. Community service options should be paid at a living wage, not a minimum wage. We should be focusing on root causes, not punishment after the fact. Fine should be income based. Do what they do with family. Surveillance and punishment are not a permanent solution. Concrete is. The school zone speed cameras are only on during school hours, right? Should we be able to speed during the summer when there's no school in session? Should we have permanent safety improvements with concrete? What's really unfair is that the streets in black and brown communities are the most dangerous. And that's not doesn't give enough thought about how to slow people's down. And we know there are speeders everywhere, in Ballard, in Laurelhurst, in Boyle Heights. Why target communities of color? The city's going to put cameras in. They better be everywhere. Wouldn't that be fair? It's not the community's fault that we put the most dangerous roadways through the south end. So some food for thought, right? I want to conclude because we're at a session about mobility justice, uh, zooming out of it, taking maybe a philosophical stance. What are some aspects of justice, right? There's social justice. Are societal programs and policies structured fairly? There's distributive justice. Are roadway safety benefits and burdens distributed fairly? There's corrective justice. Are we healing past injustices? And there's re retributive and or restorative justice, right? They don't, we don't need both of them all the time, but are wrongdoers being punished fairly? Are there actually wrongdoers here when people are driving the speed 
that the roadway encourages them to drive at? Are they doing wrong? They're breaking the law, right? But is that wrong? And are we offering alternatives to punishment that are viable? So I'm not going to answer this, but uh, I think you can all answer it for yourself. Is automated enforcement in Seattle just? Right? None of us want people to die on the streets. When I'm biking, I want cars to be going the speed limit. But is sending out $200 tickets three weeks after the fact, is that, is that solving this problem? Is that the right approach? Is that the future we want here in Seattle? I'll end with that, and uh, thank you all for being here. I think there'll probably be some uh, chance for audience engagement soon. Uh, but I'll pass it off to Ed. I will answer the question, and the, the answer is it's absolutely unjust. Uh, and I want to be clear, and I'll give my two cents, and then we'll ask the next speaker to come up. That there's two issues happening among the, the, the number here. But number one is we're talking about an unjust tax on the poor of working class folks and saying, you know what, we can't tax you on your income, but we're going to take your money every time you come through the school zone. And they do. And you say, wait a minute, isn't it good for the school? Or Ethan, you know, it slows it down. Yes, it, it does slow it down, but it wasn't designed to slow you down. And so actually it incentivizes the dependency of people speeding because $3 million is a lot of money. And so it's, it's doing the inverse of what it's suggesting that it's meant to do. And so we really have to think in a different world of what this actually means. How, how do we encourage the design of slowing the cars down so the cyclists and pedestrians and folks who are moving around the cities do feel safe? But I'll tell you what, at the end of it, when you tax my tia or my uncle for $237, they start to question whether they can live in Seattle. This is part of the gentrifying mechanisms of cities. And it doesn't have to say the word, it just practices it. With that being said, I want to bring up a friend, a colleague, uh, Lorena Gonzalez, who is a legislative director at ACLU of Washington, a nationally and locally recognized civil rights attorney, and also someone who I was proud to say represented me on the city. and I hope you all are um, enjoying the presentation so far. Um, so my name is Lorena Gonzalez, I she, her pronouns. I am the current legislative director for the ACLU of Washington, which is a civil rights and constitutional um, protecting organization. It's a nonprofit made up of mostly lawyers, of which I admit I am one. And, uh, <laughs> And we focus our efforts largely on protecting the civil liberties and the civil rights and the constitutional rights of people in the state of Washington through our state um, advocacy and also some local advocacy as well. But I'm here today to talk specifically about the intersection of um, equity and safety on our roads. And you might be wondering, what does that have to do with police reform? And um, I'm happy to share a little bit of our perspective of why the issues that Seattle Greenways and so many of you work on every day in terms of traffic safety are um, at the core of what we are trying to accomplish statewide as it relates to police reform. So, I'm just going to let us sit with this slide for a little bit. These are the names of individuals who have been killed in the course of a traffic stop and a forced interaction with law enforcement, including brothers, sisters, who are right here in our own community. This is why we do the work. We are driven by the communities we are accountable to, to fight against police violence and to prevent interactions between people and law enforcement when it is absolutely unnecessary for that interaction to occur and when it does nothing to advance our safety in community and make our roads safer. 
And that's the reason, that's the reason we are told as a society that it's important to stop people for things like expired tabs or a broken taillight or because a headlight is out. But we don't have to accept that as a system in our state. I want to take us back to 2020 when we were all living separate from each other, when we were dealing with the scariness of a pandemic, and then the news broke via a viral video of the murder of George Floyd. And what we saw in the aftermath of that was thousands of people across the world mobilizing and demanding police reform and accountability that was real and that was swift and that was frankly, uh, from lawmakers' perspectives, radical, but from communities' perspective, particularly BIPOC communities, long overdue and sensible policy solutions. That brings us to our 2021 legislative session, where we saw for the first time in the state of Washington historic, historic policies passed in the state of Washington to directly respond to community demands for actual transformative police reform that would keep our communities safe. That led to 27 policing bills being introduced at the state level. That is a historic number of bills introduced at the state. 14 of those bills passed in the 2021 legislative session. And who priorities were and which of those bills passed. Huge, huge wins. And it was the first time we've ever seen this kind of mobilization. It was intersectional, it was diverse in terms of race and um, ethnicities represented in the coalition spaces. People from all, all walks of life and across the state came together to, to advocate at the state for these, um, these, these bills. And it is it is because of that hard work and because of the hard work and the sacrifice and um, unfortunately the suffering of people who have lost loved ones to um, police violence that we've seen this success. So much kudos to them. And really our guiding principles in 2021 were to do two things. One is to attack things, um, laws that currently were on the books that, that uh, increase the chance of police violence occurring, and to also support policies that would effectively reduce police violence, while also increasing accountability when the system failed us and there was some, and there was a constitutional or civil rights um, uh, violated. And then 2022 came, and so did 2023. And what we saw in the two years after, um, in the two to three years after George Floyd's murder, was a horrific backlash on civil rights and constitutional protections um, for all of us to be safe from police violence. And that led to the regrettable rolling back of many of the reforms I just talked about. The most recent rollback was around vehicular pursuits that would now uh, soften the standards and allow uh, law enforcement to um, more easily pursue people in their cars when they were trying to get them for whatever it is they think is problematic. And we know that this is contributing to, uh, to deaths on our roads because police pursuits are one of the most dangerous tactics used by police officers, and bystanders die all the time, as do the officers who are doing the chasing, as do the suspects that are being chased. Be that as it may, that was the last of the uh, standing police reform bills that unfortunately um, was not defended and protected in this last session. But there is hope. What is our current advocacy? We cannot lose sight of the need um, to continue to fight against police violence. And that time is now, and I'm so happy that we've been in partnership with so many folks here today to really continue 
um, the, the opportunity to keep fighting for safety and equity on our roads. There are policing bills that we're gonna be championing um, in the coming years, including in 2024. The first one is the Traffic Safety for All Bill. The second is the Access to Fairness Act, which would end qualified immunity in the state of Washington and allow families to seek recourse and justice in court without the barrier of, um, of qualified immunity. The third is strengthening the Attorney General's ability to investigate and reform problematic police departments. And the fourth, which is a Washington Coalition for Police Accountability Priority, is creating an independent prosecutor office. I'm gonna be focusing my comments this evening on the first bill, which is a traffic safety for all bill, but obviously happy to answer any questions about any of the other uh, priorities that we have. So here are some um, testimonies from, um, unfortunately, relatives of people who have lost folks to police um, violence. The first one is from Sonia Joseph, who, is a, who was the mother of Giovan Joseph McDade, who was stopped in Kent for expired tags. That's it. No other offense. And he was shot and killed. Second is the cousin of Charlena Lyles, Tanya Isabel. And I know many of us are very familiar with this particular incident, but in that case, Charlena was calling for help and ended up being killed by Seattle Police Department. The reason I'm sharing these stories is because it's important for us to ground ourselves in what it means to say that we're fighting for equity and quite literally fighting to keep people alive. And all of the literature and all of our experience tells us that, the, that when individuals are forced to interact with law enforcement, when that interaction is not necessary, it most times leads to some kind of force being used, and unfortunately, in too many instances, it ends up in death. 1513 would help to stop that. It does three things. It, it includes a community grant fund that could be used to support low income road users to fix their vehicles to avoid the violations. If you can't afford to pay for your headlights or your tags, you can't afford to pay the ticket when you're stopped for not having paid your tag. This is a common sense solution that we should be funding immediately and at the scale needed to get people the resources they need so they can fix their uh, vehicle issues and prevent having to be trapped in the cycle of fines and penalties, arrests, or even worse, being shot. The second is prioritizing safety stops, prioritizing actual safety stops. So this bill would reduce weaponized enforcement of non-moving violations, because that's what we're doing. We're asking somebody with a weapon who has the right to kill you or subject you to the force of being exposed to um, a gun. We're, we're, we're asking those folks to do non-safety related traffic stops. The second thing um, that we would do in terms of prioritizing safety stops is restricting irrelevant questioning and voluntary searches on these low level stops. These stops, traffic stops in particular, are largely used as fishing expeditions to sniff around your car and find out what else might be happening so they can bust you on something much, much harsher and put you into the criminal um, legal system. The third is data collection. We want to have statewide uniform statistics uh, that are being tracked consistently and regularly, and that those and that that data is being uh, provided to the public for analysis. We want to know who's being stopped, why they're being stopped, and what was the outcome of that stop. So I already spoke a little bit about the grant fund. Again, supports low-income road users. It would uh, come in the form of repair vouchers. Um, there could be taillight installation workshops. We could fund helmets. 
Um, we can uh, also uh, provide fee waivers for expired tabs. And you know, our imagination is our only limitation in terms of thinking about how to best use those community grant funds. Uh, 1513 also, importantly, um, would require that there could be no stops, no police stops for non-moving violations. So that's things like driving with your license suspended, a misdemeanor warrant, and the only exception to that is if your equipment failure presents an extreme public safety risk, an actual road safety risk. It would also require that all stops, except gross misdemeanors and felony, it would require that the officer log and state the reason for the stop so we can go back and double check and have accountability and make sure that there isn't some sort of like fake reason why you're being pulled over. It would not allow consent searches, meaning that uh, uh, in many in many instances, um, constitutionally, you're not you're not required to agree to a, what's called a search, a consent search of your vehicle. They have to ask if you want your car search, if they can search your car, and you must consent to that. In these low uh, risk, non safety related stops, we're saying that's off the table. You are not allowed to even ask if you can search the vehicle so that you can engage in your fishing expedition which is rife with racial, dis racial disparities. So again, no questioning beyond the violation unless the peace officer detects evidence that establishes reasonable suspicions sufficient to question the operator about an independent criminal offense. So in other words, you have to have an actual reason why you need to search the car or engage in any kind of questioning beyond the initial reason that you were stopped. So, data collection. What we heard this last legis legislative session is that the number one reason why law enforcement needs to pull us over for expired tabs or tinted windows or broken taillights is because it'll lead to creating safer communities and prevent deaths on the road. And one of the things that was argued was, well, how else are we supposed to find all these drugs and guns roaming around in people's cars if we can't pull them over for expired tags? Because, you know, there's a correlation between the two. I'm being sarcastic for those of you who can't pick up on my sarcasm. Um, and what we learned is that Washington State Patrol had stopped 11 million motorists. Uh, and I think this is from from, data in, from 2008 to 2018, they stopped 11 million motorists on the road, and they found contraband material, i.e. drugs or guns, in only 0.27% of those stops. So this is, this is a red herring. It is a false argument. The real reason they are pulling people over has nothing to do with producing true community safety or frankly, preventing death. What we need officers doing is focusing on the real uh, dangerous activity, like people who are driving too fast or who, um, who are um, engaged in other really reckless behavior on the roads that puts pedestrians and other drivers at risk. So that's 1513, it's a traffic safety for all bill. It is a bill that would allow us to both prioritize equity on our roads as well as, um, as uh, safety and prevent actual traffic related deaths while not penalizing people because they cannot afford to maintain their already really expensive vehicles. So if we are able to um, achieve the goal of passing this bill, we believe it will be truly transformational. It is a top priority for Washington Coalition for Police Accountability, which is led by, by directly impacted families of police violence. And, um, and we're excited to give it another go in 2024, and we need all the help we can get. Um, so if you, uh, if you have a, a story about a bad traffic stop, would love to hear that and to get that testimonial. You can join our coalition, you can sign up for our emails, you can volunteer to write a letter to the editor or an op-ed, and most importantly, you can talk to your lawmaker, not just at the state level, but at the local level as well, to make sure that they um, know that you are supportive of a bill that will produce equity and reduce um, and increase safety on our roads for all of us. So 
Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Lorena. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear the work that's happening, the, the powerful work from the legislative side in Olympia that we absolutely need to happen. Uh, and we'll be able to ask some questions in a bit. I'm sure they're, they're nestled there in your mind, waiting to just raise your hand and say, wait, 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 I have a question. But we will, we will bring them back. We want to make sure we get to hear from everyone. The next person uh, is also someone who's been doing some amazing work. Her name is Rosa Lopez. Rosa is an organizer and community member with Reconnect South Park, and we'll talk a bit about the organizing that they've been doing, the projects, and, and really how we should be thinking about the work in South Park and what we need to do outside of just what's happening here in Beacon, downtown, North Seattle, that South Park is also just as important for, for our support and our organizing. Rosa. Freeway, and it's for uh, pollution for uh, people who live next to the freeway 
and it's how they life, 30 years. Uh, and I also hear about like the people, the kids, they have a high uh, asthma on that uh, area. Well, you say, why did not move out? Yes, why did not move out? This is not a solution. Because when you make home, you want to stay there with the people you know. And I like to be part of the community, and I would like to be part also on my kids or my other son's life. And we live in this community, and we, we fight against uh, injustice. We, we fight together, and sometimes this freeway is not necessary, it's alternative. So why, why we not take it out and build something better? So this is the timeline on the project. We, we have uh, this uh, timeline for uh, all the organizations we've been doing with all the work we are doing now. And now we are uh, having a technical team they do the studies and also it's like potential what we can do and what we can possible do there. If they remove the freeway, also where they want to send the traffic and where uh, what we can make there. We also asking the people who also live there because I don't want to put something they not need it. And I will be talking to people who live in South Park and most they're uh, minorities and they renters. And they've been renting some people for like 15 years there. They now afford to buy their house. So we're planning and uh, making this space. Maybe they can have houses there and they can live there. And they're happy. They say like, if I have a place to live and it's my own and I can afford to pay for it, that would be great and less pollution if they run the freeway. I talked to one of the members of the community and she was a wonderful woman. She was telling me she lived literally next to the freeway and her uh, patio is part of the freeway also. And people, when they uh, find people cross their property and they cut the, uh, the fence, and she said like, yeah, I cannot stop them because there's not many choices to cruise and it's also dangerous for people to cross through freeways uh, in the night time. They will be put in danger of their life and also like people not expecting someone cross the freeway in the night time. So we can see uh, the so like so other other uh, communities they have been doing this, remove freeways and make it uh, places. We don't need a big freeway. It's very uh, wide, unnecessary, and they took so much of space. So we can do like other cities. Uh, I will be put more uh, pictures. See the. How can we remove can benefit the city? You, you think to yourself, uh, sometimes we want to go quick to places and we want to communication. But sometimes it's unnecessary to have so many freeways. We also need places for walk, we also need green places so we can have a nice air and free uh, health. In South Park is one of the uh, 45 projects around the United States to be selected in 2023 for a federal reconnecting communities grant. So, <laughs> it is an uh, honor for our communities to be selected on that only 45 project. So it's a lot of work and also a lot of people work on put this together and we appreciate also the people not here and they put a lot on this and we working together and I invite you also like if you one day have an idea talk to the community and we can make change and we also we working forward to make change for a better life for our community and for our kids. You will see examples. It was a neighborhood and now it's a freeway. And we do a lot of things in South Park and you guys invited to come and join us. It's gonna be like Supa Upa and it's a Mercredito Tuesday and you can engage with the community because it's where I want to have a community where we can know who lives there and
welcome the people can come and meet the past. The history of the South Park, it was like called South History. The first people living there, they being removed, and uh, also other people moved there, and they being removed. One is uh, the community of Italian and Japanese, and it's a sad story behind there. And most of the South Park uh, is a farm land. Most they have veggies, they cut every morning the veggies, and they sell it in the marketplace in here. And it was very, like, grateful to have veggies from the neighbors, right? But they use it for other purpose, and there's very little piece of land is still doing the farmer. This called the matter farm. And they cut the veggies every morning in the summer, and they sell it, and it was nice to have a piece of history there. You will see here where it used to be the river, very like curved, so they can prevent uh, other things like water. If you see the, the ties coming out and the land is getting over with water and people living there, they get water in their houses and all the water is not clean, the water is polluted, so most of the people living in polluted uh, in the so there's some picture of the history of all the farmers that used to live there, the Japanese farmers in South Park. 1933, the South Park uh, and the other side where we uh, there, uh, come down here. It was the one of the bridge connecting South Park to Georgetown. And it's also like you can see uh, through the lines there for a South Park. is how to be South Park before the, uh, the freeway. So you can see kind of like timeline. You see where uh, that's the start is where the people uh, most uh, spend their time and most the kids. It's very close to the freeway. Uh, this is one of the houses uh, from the Japanese in the past, and also I read uh, one of the book about the community of South Park, and one of the sad stories I read is about like the guy talk about his family, his house, and he say, my house is in good condition. Why they want to tear down my house? It's where I live, it's where I grow my kids. And it was like this. I can't imagine they take my house down and just put a freeway and with only the purpose to everybody move out. And they said the uh, Highway uh, 99 was built through South Park in the 1950s and 1960s. And this time, the city, it was like a rush for a huge uh, freeway, but also it's planning to build other freeways around. But they already have the prior night, and they already have the marginal. I will present take more longer, but I just want to try quick. <laughs> and this is how far today. This is what we also doing in South Park, not only like a freeway, we also having a lot of people and having fun and engage with the community. They have a food line and it's awesome also have a, a lot of people come down and we will be making change, that will be make a change for better. That's the industrial area, and this is the South Park. They present the freeway. Wamish River. And this is living next to the highways have been shown that cause many adverse health outcomes. Asthma, decreased function, cardiovascular disease, adverse disease outcomes childhood cancer and depression. That's why we're thinking about uh, health for people and for us. That's where the people spend more time and most for our kids. The concourse, the Church of Rizar, community center, community center Fresfield, uh, the skate park and the library. This is the one of the sites 
guys I've talked to you about before were the Clipon Gulf. And it's a great opportunity to have a nice place there. And if you're not a house, we can build also cars and we can have a place where we can use our bikes or we can just walk and have a nice time there. Together, we will explore in future this year for South Park and this segment on highway. This is many of the possibilities we can do together. but it would be long. So I want to stop here and I want to thank you all to be here and listen and hopefully we can make a lot of change for a better future and for our kids and for our health. Okay, thank you. Rosa, uh, you can have a seat. Really, do we bring one more seat up here? Whoa, for the, the speakers. If I can ask the speakers to come up uh, quickly, and then we're going to have our future leaders come and, and facilitate questioning and can also have a presentation. The question I have for each of you is, what is the biggest challenge to achieve the outcomes in the work that you presented to us today? And what would it take to overcome those challenges? And that's my baby in the back, Sandino. He's also excited. Uh, but, so the question is, what is the biggest challenge to the work that you presented today? And what is it going to take to overcome that challenge? Uh, well, let me just go, so I'll give you a break. I'll start with Ethan, and then maybe we can come around. We actually weren't giving these questions ahead of time. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think the biggest challenge is the community. Right? There are a lot of folks, uh, when it comes to automated camera enforcement, who want cameras in their neighborhoods, who want streets, streets to be safe, and see cameras as the natural or maybe the only way for that to happen. Right? These, are, these are our neighbors, maybe people in this room, we're not all traffic engineers. We don't know that, that there are solutions out there. Uh, so many things in the toolbox that SDOT has, things like curb cuts and raised sidewalks and lane narrowing. People just want safety. And we and, 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 and expect that ticketing is the way to get there. So community is a challenge, because people want cameras. I think this is where this is where we all come in, right? Seattle is going to be having this conversation about automated enforcement. And there are going to be opportunities to engage with the city. There are going to be official surveys that SDOT will send out eventually. This process will take longer than we all expect it to, which in this case I think is a good thing. And if you, if you all can engage in that and, and tell the city that what we need is safety, but what we need is, is safety through infrastructure, safety through these proven interventions, and for the South End to be prioritized. Right? I know there are a lot of advocates here from all over the city, and we do a great job at advocating for safety improvements in a lot of neighborhoods, but not the South End. We gotta get better at that. So I think that's the solution, that's the path forward, and uh, I, I think we're all gonna be part of that.
it, it's not it's not equivalent to depolicing or um, or divesting from 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 law enforcement, and that's I think been the largest hesitation is sort of as as we are hearing the rhetoric around an increase in um, in crime in our communities um, that. That, that you know there are solutions to those public safety issues, but um, but having officers spend their time on these non-safety related um, traffic violations is not the solution. That's not the answer to the other things that we are all concerned about. I mean, we share the concern of, around gun violence. We share the concern around um, people being hurt in communities, and we think there are other solutions for those. Um, and and we fight for those as well. But I think that's our biggest challenge is sort of the um, ease with which people want to um, um, look to law enforcement to answer all of the issues in our um, in our community. So um, it's it's a t it, that's a, that's a real challenge for us um, at the state is sort of this fear of um, worsening public safety concerns in community by um, passing this bill. So the way that I think um, we can overcome that is by having folks like you, who are constituents, engaging with your, your representatives and your senators around why you think this bill um, actually increases safety on the road by making sure that law enforcement is spending their time on things that are actually dangerous behaviors on the road and not spending time on things that just unnecessarily create um, opportunities to target people of color who, uh, or low-income folks who, um, who just need this grant money to be able to correct the issues that they're having. So I think you know, a lot of that engagement, a lot of conversation, a lot of just really being nuanced about what it means to create Road safety, who we're creating road safety for, and um, and that we can have road safety, better policing, and equity. Um, we don't have to choose between those those things. Those are those are those are all um, values and principles that we can advance collectively by supporting um, this bill. And and lawmakers should have courage to do that. They shouldn't step away from. Um, producing both equity and safety for road users um, through this traffic traffic um, traffic safety vote. why we try to explain people and it's also why 
me to talk more about it. We, now I will speak the other day with the University of Washington and they tell me like about the design. I say, yeah, if you want to design something, design for a people, not just for yourself. And think about who's live there and who's want to be affected. Because mostly um, talk about like the industrial area there, they'd be affected if they cut the freeway. But yeah, they have other alternatives. And they are already using the, the river, they are already using the land, and in South Park, we have a lot of things. They should be navy there, and they send in everything there. I was talking to her. Uh, have a South Park uh, place, like we have a river, and we have a community, we have a school, but also we have all the other things. We have a polluted uh, river. We have the, all the uh, buses from the schools, they park there. And we have the station where almost the garbage, part of the garbage of Seattle is going there too. And I said, why would not have some relief for them? Why would not remove the part of the freeway to create a better place? And that was the most hard for me to try to everybody. <laughs> To everybody to pray with us, and we also want to hear what the what the people think, what they want, and what is possible for making this change. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Visioning for, for all the work that's happening, but you know, I just want to put a speed bump by my house so the cars don't drive so fast. And Rosa's taking away a freeway, like that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Give it up. Now I want to welcome up Alex, Alex Lou. Yeah! Uh, from Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, uh, and he's going to share a bit about what we need to do next. Yeah. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Alex Lou. I am an SMG board member, also a WSOS member. And I gotta say that this has been really, really inspiring, the just the amount of collective energy, brilliance, and leadership that I've seen in this room. And one of the great things about being on WSOS and part of SMG is really questioning a lot of assumptions that I learned in planning school as a city planner. And being able to apply a lot of the, the things that I've learned with the various working groups here um, into my daily practice as a transportation planner. So, um, one way that you can also uh, you know, continue this work, and one of the most direct ways, is by making a donation to Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. So if you pull out your program card, you'll find a QR code on the back and a link that will take you to this action page where you can click Donate to support some of the work that you've heard, including WSOS. And by making a donation, you can help uh, invest in BIPOC-led and BIPOC-focused organizing, uh, such as Who Streets, Our Streets, and uh, your gift will also support uh, to our work to fix dangerous streets and build safe places for people to walk, bike, and grow in communities uh, most impacted by traffic violence. So I am so motivated to help uh, move this work forward. I even made a donation last week to help support this effort. Now it's your turn. So take out your phones, scan the QR code on the back of the program, um, and tap the donate button uh, and, you, and put that credit card to work. <laughs> so, yes. Um, and the gifts of, F, of every size are welcome and appreciated. Um, every dollar really does count. Um, and so, uh, and the great news is that we have a $2,500 challenge from our board. Uh, so, appreciation for the board members. I see you out there uh, for step, stepping up and helping us resource this really important work. Um, so, I just want to say thanks again uh, to everyone who's been able to make a donation uh, and help match that challenge that the board um, has put together and investing in um, all these campaigns that are really pushing the needle forward in terms of making uh, Seattle a more equitable, equitable place. So, thanks so much. I'm going to make one last announcement request. You know, Alex got up and just kind of shared that donations help a ton. Uh, I don't really do this, uh, but I did this because my sister, KL, and my sister, Merlin, 
reached out and, and asked me. And with KL being a part of this, this is the real deal. This is the work that changes outcomes in our community. This is the work that makes me feel safe because I know she's a part of it. This is the work that grounded in justice means that black, brown, indigenous folks lead the conversation and demand justice. They say, we won't leave this table until we get it. That says, we won't leave our communities until we get it. That say, at the end of the day, if it's me putting it on the line, sacrificing or getting justice, then we're going to put it on the line. And so I'm so grateful that everyone came out, stuck, stuck it out with us. I hope you had a good time. I learned a ton. Go tear down a freeway. Let's get the police stopped from killing us. And let's make sure that, as Ethan shared with us, that we don't tax our communities because we want them to get out of here. Let's make our streets safer because we've designed them safer. Thank you all so much. Shout out to SMG.